I'm reading from Matthew 6. Let's look at the prayer itself. Matthew 6, verse 9. Jesus said to his disciples and also to you and me, after this manner, in this way, therefore pray ye our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what we're doing, we're taking each phrase as it comes up in the series that we're teaching. And so today's phrase will be from verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Luke called it sin. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. So if you're taking notes, the message title today is Forgiving Others as God forgives us. Let me just read the verses right after Jesus closes the teaching on this prayer, verses 14 and 15. Listen to these words. He said, for if you forgive men, mankind, their trespasses, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I want you to see the importance that God places on the forgiveness of sins. Not just of his forgiveness of our sin, but especially our forgiving other people who trespass against us. This is really what this is about today. He says, if you forgive mankind their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not mankind their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this word forgive here literally means to release. God has released all of us from our sins. And the same way God has released us from our sins, He expects all of us to forgive others who have sinned against us, to release them. Now, let me just share this thought with you this morning, because I don't want you to be in confusion as to what Jesus is saying here. Understand that when Jesus was in his ministry, he ministered grace. He ministered towards his looking at the cross. You understand that? When he was in his ministry, he had yet to go to the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of all sins. But it was kind of like a promissory note. He ministered God's grace. But many times he ministered under the old covenant law. He ministered things that were from the Mosaic law. And that's exactly what's taking place here. When he says, if you don't forgive other people their sins, neither will your father forgive you of your sins or release you from your sins. Well, old covenant told us that if you did good, you'd get good from God. I've taught you that before. But under the Mosaic Covenant, if you did bad, you got bad. And so you had to move first before God would move in your life under the Mosaic Old Covenant. Everything has changed in the New Covenant. God now moved in that He sent Jesus to the cross, and now we are the recipients of everything that God has done. You don't do good to get good from God. You now receive from God what He's already provided by sending His precious Son to the cross. Can I have an amen? You say, I don't know if I can buy into that. Check it out in the Scripture for yourself. Check me out. How many times have you heard me tell you, don't believe it because I say it, check me out. And take your religious glasses off when you read the Scripture and let the Holy Spirit show you the truth, family. Let Him show you the truth. Let me prove this to you with New Testament theology through the Pauline revelation or the revelation that God gave to the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 4.32. Is that New Testament enough for you today? 
He says, and be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Listen, forgiving one another. Even, everybody say even, as God in Christ forgave you. So he's already forgiven us. And now, for instance, in Romans 5, 5, Paul said that the love of God, the agape of God, the unconditional, no strings attached, sacrificial love has now been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We can love like God. We can forgive just like God. Why? Because God loves us and we know that. And God has forgiven us. And that's what Paul says. You're forgiven. Not because we earned it. Not even because we deserved it. Because we don't. It's all based on God and his love for us. It's not because we're so lovely. It's because Jesus is lovely. It's because of what he's done for us. If we think that we have to earn God's forgiveness, you know what will happen in our own lives? When people offend us or sin against us, we'll hold a grudge until we think they have paid enough to earn our forgiveness. It happens. Let me dig a little deeper here. Romans chapter 4. Say we, I, I think sometimes Christians really don't understand what God went through to get our sins forgiven and remitted out of the way. Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This word accounted is an accounting term. It comes from the word count. As a result of Adam's sin, we're all born into sin. So there is an account, a ledger that has sin in it. For all of us. From the moment we're born, that ledger, that accounting, has sin in it. Look at verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, I qualify, his faith is accounted, there's that accounting term again, for righteousness. This is what took place at Calvary. When Jesus shed his blood from 12 noon to 3 p.m., Jesus became sin with all of our sin on the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him was bringing back unto God his heavenly Father, a people who would be in right standing with him as Adam was before he sinned. Yeah, come on. The joy was redemption. Propitiation. That's a big theological term that just means all the wrath of God for Adam and all of our sin was poured into the body of Jesus until God the Father was satisfied, and the last word Jesus spoke on the cross was, it is finished. Redemption is now a done deal. Sin has been taken care of. And when we receive Jesus as our Savior, what takes place? That ledger that was accounted with sin is white clear, and now there is a new characteristic, if I can use that term, placed into your account. Paul said, it's now righteousness. Yeah. It's, right, it's right standing with God, approval by God. Jesus placed his righteousness into our account. Let me go a little further here. 2 Corinthians 5.19. I mentioned this earlier. Let me prove it. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing another accounting term, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us, the church, the word of reconciliation. 
Paul makes it clear. God no longer is counting our sins against us. Well, here's a revelation that many Christians don't have. This verse, I'll give you another verse. 1 John 2, 2 says the same thing. That God is not holding your and my sins against us, but He's also not holding the sins of the unbelieving world against them. Jesus, God the Father, is no longer imputing the sins of of the Christian and or the unbeliever to them. Well, Pastor, does that mean that everybody goes to heaven under the doctrine of inclusion? Universalism is what that's called. That everybody, when they die, they go to heaven because their sins have not been imputed to them. It does not mean that. No, Jesus, why do people go to hell for their unbelief? Jesus said in John chapter 3, if you believe, you have life. But he said, those who don't believe are already in death. They go to hell. Even though their sins are not being held against them. Even though God has not imputed their sins, they go to hell. Because they're, no, they're not believing. That's the sin that puts people in hell. Not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So if we really, church, if we really believe that our sins are forgiven, then you and I will no longer hold the sins of people against them. So I have two points I want to share with you today. Point number one, confess your debts. So if sin is out of my account, and if righteousness is in my account now, why does Jesus want me to confess my sins? Why, why, why do I need to confess my sins? Well, there's a difference between the shedding of blood. Listen carefully. You might learn something. There is a difference between the shedding of blood and the sprinkling of blood. Jesus shed his blood once and for all, but the blood can be sprinkled as it's needed. Let me show you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats, old covenant, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies or sets apart for the purifying of the flesh. So under the old covenant, the blood would be sprinkled to purify their flesh. It could not release their spirit from the sin nature. It just sprinkled the flesh, made their bodies pure but not their spirit. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ? So he makes the contrast between the old and the new, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Listen, this is relevant and important. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let me clarify one more time. The next chapter, chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, a pure heart. See, if you can draw near with a true heart, that means you can draw with an impure heart. That some people try to do and it doesn't work. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And now our bodies washed with pure water. The blood doesn't wash our bodies. The Word of God does. It's the blood that sprinkled will clear and cleanse our conscience. Here's the way it works. As a believer, folks, we still sin. We sin with our words and we sin with our actions. But Jesus also made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that we can even sin with our thoughts. So you may be pure even with your actions, even sometimes with your words, but those thoughts, it's still sin. And so, as I've taught you before, Jesus taught us in John 16, 7, 8, and 9, the Holy Spirit will convict of one sin. He convicts of one sin. 
He convicts the unbeliever, the sinner, of the sin of unbelief towards Christ, as I just mentioned. Once you're born again, the Holy Spirit convicts the believer, but of righteousness. Read it for yourself. It's there. He does not convict the believer of sin. The writer of Hebrews just told us how we're convicted of sin. Where? It's our conscience that convicts us. It's our conscience, not the Holy Spirit. The conscience came into play when Adam sinned. God did not give Adam a conscience until he sinned. That's when the conscience arose in his life. And now we see here that the conscience will convict you of the sin. And this is the way it works. If we don't go to God and confess that sin, what happens? Satan gets in there. And what does he do? He starts condemning. He doesn't convict. He condemns. He's the condemner. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so confessing the sin causes the conscience to be sprinkled with the blood. This is marvelous. God has us covered, church. When we confess our sins as believers... Now, I don't teach that you confess sin to be forgiven because of the two verses I've already shown you from Ephesians and Colossians. Why ask God to forgive you when you're already forgiven? You can do it if you want to. If, that's your, if you want to do that, I don't do that. You can if you want to. I'm already forgiven, but I do confess my sins. I repent of my sins. And that's what he's saying to us here. And so confessing the sin will cause the conscience to be sprinkled with the blood. This is what happens, as the Hebrew writer just said to us. If we don't confess these sins as believers, he said, we'll begin to serve God out of dead works. For what purpose? To pay for our sins. Which is a debt we can never repay. What are we trying to do? Dead works? We're trying to make it up to God. Well, Lord, I'll fast more next week because of what I just did last night. Lord, I'll add 15 minutes to my daily prayer every day. Lord, I'll give more money in the offering Sunday. What are you doing? You're trying to make it up to God with works. They're called dead works. What are dead works? Two definitions. Definition number one, one that God did not initiate. And number two, A dead work is a work that tries to appease God for your wrongdoing, making it up to God. So, church, we just confess our sin to cleanse our uh, to cleanse our conscience, so that Satan can't get in there and start condemning. Now, this is a point I think is very important in this first point. You and I have the ability to be just like God in this matter. In Hebrews 8, 12, in Hebrews 10, 17, the Bible tells us that God will never, ever again remember our sins. The word remember means to bring it up again. If we truly forgive people of their sins, that means we will never Husbands and wives, bring it up again. Nobody likes to be forgiven and then to have it brought up in their face. A day later, a week later, a month later, a year later, ten years later. God never brings up a sin to us. Never. So that was point number one, confess your debts. Number two, release your debts. Look what Jesus said to us in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Up to seven times. He thought he was being real spiritual here, but he wasn't. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, there was a saying in Israel back from the book of Genesis, that was, it was said 77-fold. Let me show you. Genesis 4, we're talking about Lamech. Lamech was one of the great-grandsons of Adam. 
In fact, he's the son of the oldest, of the person who, who lived the longest on this earth, Methuselah. And so, verse 23 of Genesis 4, Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. Listen to what he says. For I've killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. So, Lamech is saying, I snuffed this man's life out, this young man. His whole life was before him. He just hurt me. He just wounded me. He didn't kill me. He just hurt me. So I killed him. He says in verse 24, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. That's just an expression that meant seventy times seven. It was in the Old Testament, an expression of a person who sought and got revenge. That he went over the top. His attitude, this was Lamech's attitude, and you'll see many people in the Old Covenant with the same attitude. You come after me, I'm going to come back after you, and it's going to be worse for you than what it was for me, from you to me. I'm going to come at, in other words, I don't get mad. I just get even. I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to do whatever I can to make your life miserable for what you've done to me. Jesus is saying the way that you and I used to get give revenge to people. Now then, he's saying, I want you to give forgiveness to people. I want you to be gracious to people, no matter what they have done. And I close with Hebrews 12, verses 15 and 16. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of God's grace. Lest any root of bitterness springs up. Look what it does. This is the New Testament. It'll cause trouble. He says, if there's a root of bitterness in your heart, it's going to cause trouble in your life, in your marriage, with your children, with your career, with your finances, with your health. It's going to cause trouble. And he says, and by this, many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. I looked at the word defiled in the Greek text, and it literally means a moral defilement. I'm not sure this is the only reason, but people who carry sexual problems in their lives, probably in most cases, according to Scripture, it's come because somewhere a root of bitterness got into your life. It got into your life. Unforgiveness. This is, again, an opinion. I believe it's a good opinion. Jesus came to set the person free. He came to deliver you out of bondage. But sometimes we get ourselves into bondage. We get ourselves into trouble. This is just an opinion. I believe this is probably the number one, or at least in the top three, of reasons why Christians today are in bondage. Because we don't forgive because we think we have to earn forgiveness from God. And so we think that people need to earn forgiveness from us, and it holds us in bondage. There's a root of bitterness. This is why I probably believe when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, we're teaching this is a daily prayer. What happens? When you release people's sins from them, and when you confess your sins unto the Father, what happens? It reminds you every single day that God, your precious Heavenly Father, has forgiven you and me of a debt we can never repay. Yeah. It's what it does. Yeah. It keeps me reminded when I confess my sins and pray every day, Father, I know I don't deserve it, but you did it anyway. Because you wanted my life into your family the same way he wants your life in his family. 
It reminds you every day the debt that we owe to God, we can never repay. It's a debt that Jesus paid for. He did it willingly for the joy that was set before him. So church, the same way that God our Father has extended grace unto us in forgiving us, we should always extend God's grace to whoever when they need forgiveness from us, whether or not they ask for it or not, extend grace. Father, thank you for your word today.